the first thing an investor ought to ask themselves before they buy a stock, uh, even before we get to price and so on, is buying a stock uh, is, is a far more complicated activity than most people seem to think. So what's happened with the development of markets is on a smartphone or a tablet or a laptop, we can in seconds buy one of thousands of companies. And uh, there's no effort required to buy a stock, no effort required to sell a stock. But uh, in order to do well, one really needs to understand the underlying business and to have a point of view on kind of where that is versus the, the market capitalization. So I'll give you an example. Uh, many times in the US, like I'll go to my health club, for example, and one of the members will ask me, hey, Monish, uh, should I buy Apple? Should I buy Apple stock? And I turn the question around to them. I say, uh, hey, John, what's the market cap of Apple? And they look at me with a puzzled look. They said, the stock is at 170. I said, no, no, what is the market capitalization? And they don't know. OK, so the first thing, if you're going to buy, if you're going to go buy some rice in the market, you're going to know what is the price per kilogram. So the first thing is that if you're going to buy a stock, at least know what you can buy the whole company for. And most investors don't have that knowledge, which is amazing. And so the first, the first thing an investor ought to ask themselves before they buy a stock, uh, even before we get to price and so on, is, is this within my circle of competence? Now, circle of competence is a very important concept, one of the most important concepts in investing. A person like Warren Buffett, would consider something like 95% of stocks outside his circle of competence. And uh, he says that you know probably 97, 98% of things that show up on his desk go into a box called the too hard pile. He can't figure them out. Okay, so there's just a sliver of businesses. Now, if Warren Buffett can't figure out 95% of businesses, for the rest of us humans, we can't figure out 99% of them. So. Most things are going to be outside the circle of competence of most investors. So now let's say an investor answers the question correctly. Yes, I understand Apple, and I understand it's within my circle of competence, right? So the next question then comes up is the question I asked. What could you buy the whole company for? And then the second question an investor should ask is, so let's say an investor knows Apple is worth a trillion dollars, for example. So the question I would ask them is that if your family had a fortune of four trillion, would you be willing to put one fourth of that fortune into Apple? And if the answer is yes, buy the stock. If the answer is no, don't buy a single share. And so these are just very simple, which is, you know, look at your net worth, look at your family's fortune, and are you willing to put a quarter of it buying the whole company that you want to buy 100, 100 shares of? And so these are basic things that most investors, unfortunately, uh, don't focus on. Yeah. And so I feel that uh, investing in stocks, figuring out you know, what they're worth, uh, what your circle of competence is, these are complicated issues. So for most investors, it's a really good idea to index. Uh, because indexing, you can buy a Nifty 50 index or any broad index in India uh, for basis points. You know, the, the frictional cost for ETFs and all is very low. And, and the second is you average out over time. So every month when you get your, uh, your salary check, take a small portion, first put it into savings, mm. and then don't worry about it. Uh, well, what I would say, set it and forget it. Mm -hmm. Fill it, shut it, forget it. The yeah, whole yeah. Hero Honda ad. yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, so that's why I think that buying stocks uh, should really be an exception rather than the norm. Okay. Uh, the second topic, uh, and before we move on to the more nuanced investor, a sure. second thing that I wanted to talk to you about, again, we discussed this on, on email, about this whole notion of stop loss that you, f that you find amusing in India. Yes. Because apparently in the US, nobody deals with the concept of stop loss. Now, let me tell you a peculiarity here, Monish, uh, because we do this day in, day out for a living. A lot of technical experts who come in give stop losses. They are mandated too as well, because sure. it's a trading yes, day that yes. they have. They don't care about the fundamentals. They are only bothered about the charts. Right. Uh, you would still believe that the notion of a stop loss from a serious investor's perspective should be done away with. 
we don't find too many people talk about stop losses if they are serious investors, but you believe that there is enough and more talk yes. about stop loss happening on fundamental investing as well. That's right. So, in so just to clarify, sure. uh, we're not talking about the speculators and traders. Sure. So uh, more power to them. More power. Uh, uh, but, but when we come to investors, uh, I, I actually find plenty of pundits on, on, uh, on TV who uh, have done fundamental analysis and they give targets and they give stop losses. And, uh, and I find that really peculiar. So uh, the, the nature of markets, so one of the reasons why we can make a lot of money in equity markets is because they're auction driven. And auction driven markets are very different from almost any other kind of market. So to give you an illustration, let's say I bought a flat in Mumbai for one crore. I don't know if we can get one for one crore or not, but let's let's play along. Uh, we got one maybe in the in the periphery of Mumbai. Okay, so we yes. paid a crore for the for the flat, and we did research and we found that it's the right price, and we bought it. And uh, now we want to know how the price of that flat changes every day. So I have a friend who's a real estate broker, and I tell my friend, the real estate broker, listen, we're going to have chai with Pabrai every day. You and I are going to have a cup of tea. And every day, just come and tell me what the price, market price of my flat is. Okay, so you bought the flat. Next day, you invite your broker friend. And he says, so I ask him, so what's the price of my flat? He'll say, uh, listen, idiot, it's still one crore. Okay, I call him after two days. He still says, it's still one crore. And after maybe two months, he says, you know, uh, the, the little change in transactions, it's actually 1.05 crores now. It's 1.005 crores. It's gone up a little bit. And if you did this every day and you just wrote down the price he was giving you and did it for 365 days, you would, at the extreme end, find that it went to somewhere between 95 lakhs and maybe 1.1 crores or 1.15 crores in that range. Right now, let's say my flat is a listed company on the Bombay Stock Exchange, but the only asset is this flat. And every day the price is doing whatever it's doing in the market. And we chart that daily price movement. What we're going to find is in a 52 week period, the range may be something like between 70 lakhs and 1.3 crores. And the reason is that auction driven markets undershoot and overshoot. And it is the undershooting and overshooting that creates the opportunity for people like me. Right? And so, uh, so basically, uh, the idea of a stop loss would be like I bought the flat for a crore mm. and uh, so after six months my broker tells me, you know, prices have dropped about 5%. Mm. And I say to him, okay, that's my stop loss and I'm now going to sell you my flat for 95 lakhs. Please sell it, right? It would be the equivalent of doing that. The reason you bought the flat for a crore because you thought that was fairly priced and the second reason you bought it because you wanted to hold it as a long-term asset. So the same thing with stocks. If you bought a stock for 200 rupees or it has a market cap of 1,000 crores, you bought it because you thought it's worth 2,000 crores. So if it goes from 1,000 crores to 900 crores, you will, you will sell it with stop losses and it makes no sense. So I own a company called Rain Industries, right? And I, I bought that stock about, about two and a half years ago. Hmm. And when I was buying the stock, it was at about 30 rupees a share. And by the time I finished buying, it got up to 45 rupees a share. It went up almost 50% because I almost bought 10% of the business. And after I finished buying, it proceeded to go down. Just like everything I buy, <laughs> okay? The stock knows I bought it and it decides, Monish is done, now let's go down, okay? If I had engaged in stop losses, uh, Rain went down to 40, even went down to 35 after I finished buying, mm -hmm. and I did nothing. And so now rain is north of, I don't know, 360 rupees. And so that whole opportunity would have been gone. It would have been no sense for me to put a stop loss at 30 or 35 or 40 because I thought it was worth a lot more. So I think, I think investors ought to focus on making sure that that the stock is within the circle of competence, that it's worth a lot more than it's valued at, and when, once you have those two things, a stop loss makes no sense.
Wow. So, circle of competence, I think that's, that's the preliminary. The most important thing, yes. Three, the three most magical words from Ben Graham. Okay, great. Now, if, if circle of competence was, were the three most magical words from Ben Graham, I think one of the most amazing things that I've seen you speak about a lot. I've also saved that image. I can't find it right now, but you'd remember I sent that image to you, which said something like, uh, most of the times when I'm looking for an idea, I need the idea to scream at me saying, buy me. Until then, I don't yeah. go out in the, and buy. In the, in the U.S., you know, we have these uh, wooden uh, things called two-by-fours, okay. which we use in, in housing construction. I need to be hit on the head <laughs> by a two-by-four before right. I should buy a stock. Yeah. So before buying a stock, it has to be complete and total no-brainer. Okay. Uh, if, if I have to turn on Excel, it's automatic rejection. If I cannot describe the idea to a seven-year-old in two or three minutes, it's an automatic rejection. It needs to be painfully obvious, painfully obvious to the village idiot why we should be buying. Where are such opportunities currently in such an overheated market? And I, I okay, let me rephrase. I'm not using the term overheated loosely. I'm just saying the markets have rallied. We may not be in bubble territory for certain markets and all of that is a subject of everybody's individual right. opinion. Only future will show whether we were there or no. But let's assume for a moment's sake we are not in bubble territory, but we are in a, in a space where the markets are at worst, fairly valued. You will probably not get opportunities wherein you get hit by a two by four. Well, you? you know, we are in wonderful lower parale right now. And within, I would say, 10 or 15 kilometers of lower parale, from here to the next 15 kilometers, is a boatload of opportunities in okay. real estate. Okay, fine. I didn't want to get down to real estate sure, so soon. Sure. We'll, we'll get to that. But you, even right now, what I'm trying to find out, Monish, is that you are still in a market like this looking for ideas which are just too painfully obvious you're not well going i think ahead. i think i think even in uh, in rampant bull markets uh, there are always misunderstood businesses now rampant bull markets will cause a lot of overpricing and i think a lot of things are overvalued but it, there are plenty of things that may be fairly or deeply undervalued in in a market like india with 5000 listed companies more than 5000 listed companies it is just not possible in auction-driven markets that all of them are efficiently priced. Sure. We are going to have underpricing and we're going to have overpricing. Just the nature of the beast. Okay. Uh, the reason why I ask this question is a lot of uh, your peers, a lot yes. of people uh, within the same uh, space. We did a small series with Ramdev Agrawal sometime back in Bali. Wonderful Bali. guy, good friend. Yeah, okay. So, and Ramdev says often that I find value in growth. Mm -hmm. So the stock may not be underpriced or may not be a screaming buy, but if there is growth that he sees over the period of four, four five, six, ten years, maybe more, sure. and there are other factors attached to this, by the way, viewers, not just growth itself in itself, then that becomes an opportunity too. Are you looking for such opportunities in India? Because India is per se a growth market. You are definitely better off buying a growing company over a cheap no growth company. Okay. So if I buy an asset that is cheap, that has very limited growth, all I'm going to do is cover the gap between, it may be worth uh, 100 rupees a share, I'm getting it for 50, 60 rupees a share, I'm just going to make the 40 or 50 rupees over whatever period of time it takes to get there. Now if I'm buying a company that has secular tailwinds, great management and long growth engines, as long as I'm not paying up too much, it's the best place to be. Okay. And so I think, I think Ramdev, in my opinion, is one of the best investors in the country. And I think, uh, well, the only, only, I would say, critique I would have Ramdev is a tad too optimistic at times. But he's got it absolutely right that you bet on the growth engines and you breath on the long-term secular growth engines, which have got a lot of tailwinds. And, uh, and those in general uh, are going to do really well. So, uh, so I think, I think they've, got it, uh, sure. they've, got mostly, they've got it mostly right. Okay, now so the reason why I asked you this question is, very recently in one of the interviews or interactions or quotes that you gave out, you mentioned that uh, uh, you know, it might be really important to buy in compounders uh, from a long-term perspective. And there are some questions that I've gotten with regards to that as well. Somebody mm -hmm. is asking, and I have a question of my own as well, sure. as to how does Monish decide if a compounder 
Compounder is aggressively priced and has reached the tipping point of selling versus your earlier stance of selling at about 90 to 95% of the perceived fair value. How do you decide this? How do you decide that a compounder has reached a value which is overpriced and therefore you would want to get out of it? Okay, so uh, let's uh, unpack the question a little bit. Sure. So we've got two types of things we've got to do with companies, right? So we're the points at which we buy them and why we buy them and the points at which we sell them and why we sell them. Sure. Um, buying is complicated. Selling is 10 times more complicated. Okay, so, so when we're trying to buy, relative to selling, it's relatively straightforward. We want to know what the growth engines are if you're going after a growth company. We want to know what we're paying for that growth. And we want to try to figure out where is this company in five years or 10 years versus what we're paying for it. Uh, and so those are relatively straightforward uh, compared to the selling question. Uh, the selling question uh, is a more complicated question. Uh, because one of the things uh, we are forced to do is we're forced to look out into the future, uh, maybe a few years out, to try to figure out what is the future of this business. Mm. And for most companies, even the insiders have a very fuzzy idea about the future. And so, so the thing is that if we buy a compounder at... Uh, a value price, that's a relatively easy exercise because we're, we're not paying up. But the difficulty comes in when it goes up in price and it looks fully priced, but still has a lot of tailwinds and still has great management, still has a lot of great growth in front of it. So the best that I've been able to answer the question is a great company with great growth, with great management, uh, give them some leeway. So don't sell them when they're fully priced don't sell them when they're overpriced, sell them when they're egregiously priced. Okay. Now, what each of these levels are, I'll leave to the viewer, but it yeah. should be obvious. You know, when is it fully priced, when is it overpriced, when is it egregious? So what I've learned, what one of my biggest mistakes has been is selling too early. I have watched 100 baggers that I bought who went on to become 100 baggers so many times after I was out. Mm. And I'd only captured the double or the triple, and I didn't capture the remaining 98 or 97 times that it went up. But when you buy, you don't know it's going to be a 100 bagger. Absolutely. In fact, you learn, you learn about a business only after you own it. So you may do all the analysis in the world, but you're really going to learn the business after you own it. And that still doesn't mean, viewers, that you don't try and learn about the business before you buy it. <laughs> it should be in your circle of competence. <laughs>